we become aware, more aware, as we are in this life, there's moments of time, and the moments may seem intolerable, may seem lasting, but we need, in those moments, we need more of the presence of our Lord, more. The only way to do that, I think, is to remain. We've been talking about the vine and the branches. And the only way that we can draw on more is to steadily remain in the vine. Determine within ourselves, I will not move from that vine. I will not. I will not move from that vine. I wanted to talk today about fruit, more fruit, much fruit. And that's what we need. It's not, it's not only bearing fruit out here. It's, it's letting the fruit manifest in us so that it strengthens us. It brings us those supernatural things that he has promised to us that sometimes you may think is away somewhere, but they're still here. You know him, they're here, they're in us, and we need the manifestation and the expression of that. Our lives, sometimes, I was talking to Scott earlier, and he says there's more manifestation out there of the other side of the aisle. But on our side, there is a majority. There is the victory. So fruit, more fruit, much fruit, is based on the branches grounding in the vine. Even good ground has a variable harvest of 30, 60, and 100 fold. The branches that resist the flow of the vine or the flow of the vine's life has stunted growth or does not receive the maximum of what God has for us. Resistance or restriction of the flow of this life, knowing or unknowing, limits the fruit's yield or you get a diminished harvest. The branch must yield to the vine in order to yield fruit more and much. The branches, singular purpose, the branches you and I in the vine, our singular purpose is to be fully attached to the, to the vine and cleansed by the word. Our singular purpose, remain attached. We are this morning going to look at uh, back to John 15, we're going to look through 1 through 10. I'm going to re just read three verses now and end up on the third verse, and that's the one that will be on the board. Again saying, I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it. I'm going to pause there for a moment. He purges it. Anybody want to venture how he purges it? Okay. He cleanses it. He purges it. Probably most of you, the word that jumped up and fixed in you is prunes it. Strong uses it. But I found an interesting thing in doing this study. And you're going to hear it part way through here. And I'll try to remind you that this is what I'm talking about. So 
that it, he purges it, that it brings forth more fruit. Then he says in the third verse, and that's the one that's right here, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. How do you get spiritually clean and remain spiritually clean or clean? Cleansed, pure through the word. If I was to tell you, and I am going to tell you rather vocally and rather bluntly, God's spiritually spiritual gardening tool, no matter what you've heard, is the word of God. Not the knife, not the storm, not the sickness, not this, not that. The spiritual tool that he uses is the Word of God. Now hang on. You say, well, how does it work? Well, let's take a quick look at Hebrews 4.12, because here is an example. For the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. So if you want sharp, there it is. But it's the Word of God. It's not the knife. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit. That's what gets right down inside you. The joints and the marrow. The discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Where it goes there. No knife is going to get there and leave you alive. The Word of God will get there and leave you alive and functioning. Boy. Second Timothy 3, 16 through 17, saying this about the Word of God. All Scripture, how much Scripture? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine. Now, I read this definition this week of doctrine, and I had to insert it because it's instruction to function. Doctrine, instruction on how to function. Remember, Jesus, was, Jesus ministry was an eye-opener for the Jews. They were always commenting on his doctrine. He cast out demons, and it said, they said it's his doctrine. So on, he lived supernaturally according to his doctrine or his instruction as how to function. For reproof, education, training. And what? In righteousness. For correction, back up a little. For restoration, for instruction, education, training, Chastening in righteousness. Righteousness. We've been there many times. Equality of character or acts. Representing the one who righteousness you have. As he presented it to you. The righteousness of God. The righteousness of Christ. It's right there. And it is our character. And how we are to act. Innocent and holy. The Theological Dictionary of New Testament Words calls it right conduct before God and is pleasing to Him. Righteousness. Given to you as a gift. You stand before Him pleasing, without guilt, without condemnation, with assurance that He is who He says He is. He will do what He says He'll do. That the man of God may be perfect, complete, thoroughly furnished, equipped fully unto all good works or occupation. In other words, you have freedom to bear fruit, more fruit, much fruit. The branch abides in the vine. Don't think you can do this alone. You can't. You cannot draw from him on your own strength or your own goodness. You can only draw from him on the virtue that he put into your life. 
look at it. The branch abides, abides in the vine, Jesus. Then Jesus promises to abide in the branch, you. Abide is to stay in a given place, state, or relation, or of expectancy. To continue, and that's the one we'll focus on today, is to continue, to dwell, to endure, to be present, to remain, to stand. You abide in him, he abides in you. The promise, sure. Abide is to continue in me and I in you, so says John 15, 4. Abide in me and I in you, or continue in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abides or continues in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide or continue in me. Pretty self-explanatory. Then if he abides in you, what is impossible? No. Wow. I, Jesus says, am the vine. You, brethren, are the branches. He that abideth or continues in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Might as well give it up if you think you can get it done in yourself. It's not going to happen. I admit, I head for him. Then I do my best to remain in him continually, hidden in him. You say, what happened? Different things have happened and manifested over our life. The one that jumps into my system right now, I had an individual. I was sitting on an ottoman, and this individual was standing up over top of me, appeared to be over top of me. He wasn't, but right there in front of me, saying sharp, hurtful things. What happened? I sat there, and just like an igloo, over top of me come this, this, I knew it was real. It was real in the spiritual world. It wasn't real in the physical world. And it settled right completely over me, down to the floor. What happened? Whatever was said after that, I didn't hear it, nor did it make any impression. It's the way it was. I think of another one, and I won't go into detail on this one because it doesn't show up very good for LL. I was about to be had for something. You ever get that feeling you're about to be had for something? And you knew you were guilty? What'd you do? I just threw the whole thing in his lap. Did you try to deceive him? Of course not. There is no, you, there is no deceiving the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Yeah. <laughs> no deception there. You can't get that done. You can't get that bind. What happened? I come skating through. Not, not on me, but on him. Grace. Unmerited favor kicked in. There we went. You say, have you ever heard it? Had it? Oh, boy. This would start a grist of stories. Have you ever prayed for anything that you really, really wanted, that you was really, really unnecessary to have? Did you ever get it? <laughs> I got one of those. Oh, it is a monster. Yeah, it's about 30, 35 foot long. Had double bed in the back. Had closet. Had, had stove. Refrigerator had various things in it. Got it. It get exactly about four miles to the gallon. Did you need it, Lynn? No, no, no. 
No, no, no. There's a, a part in the message where you ask and you receive. I think that was one of those times. I asked and received. After we got it, didn't want it. <laughs> uh, you, you know about that, hey, Terry? <laughs> you could put Lynn and Lowell's Folly up there on it and you're just as well off. That's my brother. My, my, my. Enough of those. In our society, it's kind of fast-paced. And do you have time to stay put? I would ask you. But that's exactly what Jesus commands his followers to do in order to be productive. We still got 15 for up here. Abide in me and I in you. In other words, he's telling us to stay put. Don't go away. Don't go anywhere. The Greek word for this is meno. He abides to remain or to stay or to continue. You stay in him, he stays with you. Simple as that. Continue in him. Don't, don't, don't move away. Don't blame him for something that is not his fault. That's like going back to Mark 4 and where he planted seed and it didn't do quite well and it, they became offended when pressures came against them. And that seed did not bear. Read the whole story if you'd like. Each branch, each believer has been positioned in the vine. That is, in Christ, Jesus orders each branch to remain in union with him. Not to attain that union. You say, whoa, Lynn. Look at Jesus extends his invitation. Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you what? Rest. What did you do? You came to him. What was the result of that? He gave you rest. Repose. He refreshed you. That's Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. 11, 30 says this. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You say, boy, is it more than I can bear at the moment. But is, it, is he the source? He's saying, that which is from me is light. Is that what he says? My yoke is easy. Don't feel, I don't, my burden is light. His yoke is easy, it's gracious and kind. It's light. His yoke is to join, or it's a coupling of two together. My yoke, Christ's yoke, is not simply imparted by him, but you share it with him. Make sense? And Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, and you should find rest unto your souls. Now, hang on. I want to explain. I want to just take a moment and talk about soul. Soul in the Greek is a word called psyche. It's basically the mind. You ever had a mind that run amok? Does it paint pictures, pretty pictures? Not if it can find other pictures to paint. It is made up of intellect, will, and emotion. Intellect, how you think, what you think. Will is you have the opportunity to turn it on or off. There is thoughts I refuse to think. Do I have the opportunity to think them? Yes. There's thoughts that he says, don't think about that anymore. I say, 
I told him, this, this literally happened. I said, I can't. In myself, I can't stop that. With you, we can stop it. What happened? I had the opportunity to think those thoughts. But I made choices to not. What was the result of that? Today, there is a wall. Somebody gets talking about certain topics, and I think back, and I, oh, and I butt right up against that wall. It's, 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 it's as real to me as if it was a wall over that door. I know it's there. I know I've just butted up against it. I also know what the directive was. Don't think it. If I chose, I could go through it. There's things, there's things that we don't need on our plate. Dealing with intellect, will, and emotion. Is all emotion wrong? No. I kind of, I kind of let. Ruth stirs my emotion. Okay? Good ones. Let's do this. Oh, let's not do it in my family. <coughs> and I'm not going to do it in yours either. Uh, this imaginary family. Imaginary family. I don't know why I think about the, the wife, probably because I'm a guy, so let me just change it. The, the husband being a tad inconsiderate fires off things that are not edifying. I don't know. There's, I'm not asking any husband here if they ever done that, you know, or hurtful. But then the mate on the other end of this has a choice, and it's literally a choice. Are they going to be offended? Are they going to take it personal? Are they going to enter into this and let it escalate? You say, well, just a minute. I'm talking, I'm not talking about life and death things. I'm talking about ongoing internal things. There's also emotional things that needs to be addressed, needs peace, needs comfort. There's also those life and death things or dramatic changes that happens in families. Those things just need some solutions. And we need God's solutions. We need to think upon those things. Can we take Quite how to address this. There's times in life when we're required to take steps that we don't want to take but need to take. And those steps, no matter what we've been taught regarding them, with God's permission, with God's understanding, with God directing the way, whether we know how to take them or not, we must take them when they involve things that needs to be addressed. 
I'll just wow okay I'll just leave that we find rest unto our souls in 1129 right down here this is life in the vine he who invites you says come Upon your acceptance and your desire to abide, he then places you in the vine, attaches you to that which meets your need, and sustains your life abundantly, and also reproduces itself or his life on through you, the branch. In John 15, 4, the instruction was to abide in me and accept ye abide in me. Therefore, abide is a directive. It is imperative. John 15, 4. Can we do that again? Abide in me, a directive, and I in you, a directive. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. The fruit bearing, this is actually, the whole act of abiding is, and the views and the act is a single event. In 15.5, then he says this, I, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, continues in me, and I in him. The end result is right here. You'll bring forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Now, what is the fruit? If you look at commentators, some is going to tell you it's new convert. Others assert it's the fruit of the Spirit. The devotional writer Andrew Murray said this, the essential idea of fruit is, is that it is the silent, natural, restful produce of our inner life. It's what's in there comes out on the branch and you bear that fruit. It's a practical expression of the indwelling spirit in our lives and it should attract and will attract others. Each branch that does not continue to abide in the vine is withered. And here's where I'll remind you of purging again. 15.6, I believe. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is what? Withered. Does that say he's cut off? He's withered. He's withered. And men gather them and cast them where? Into the fire and they are burned. I don't know if anybody has fruit trees, but I watch my neighbor. I have to drive right by his little orchard. And he's out there. He took some. I walk through the woods. What happens? I got a whole group of pines behind us. What happens on those bottom branches? They dry up. What are they, are they, would you call that withered? What happens to them? It breaks off. They fall off. Wug wants to clean it. He goes out and cleans all them up and burns them. But notice they're withered. They're not cut off. I just find that an interesting thought process. Withered. Withered. Serviled, dried up, parched, to waste away, and men gather them. On the positive side, Jesus assures his disciples of the fruitfulness of each branch that continues to abide in him. Abiding in the vine is abiding in God's word. Now here, and keeping Jesus' instructions, John 15, 7 through 8. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Boy. Or it shall come into being unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. If you continue in my word, back in verse 4, 3, we are clean through his word. We went to two other scriptures, 
And it says in one scripture, it said that we were perfect by his word. Another scripture says we're completely fully equipped by his word. I'll take his word, thank you, and be shaped by it. And in the process, we'll bear fruit. A disciple bears fruit. In John, uh, we don't have it on the board today, uh, 8, 31, and 32, I'll just give you a, a rendition of it. It says, if you continue in his word, then you are his disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Right here in verse 8, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciple. We continue in his word as disciples, students, learning. We can say the disciple is someone who continues then in God's word until they are clean and free. And it, the word, can be witnessed in our lives as fruit. I think there's a consistency then in that life. While abiding, we ought to walk even as he walked. 1 John 2, 6. I can remember years ago when this scripture jumped out at me. He that saith he abideth or continues in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Who's he talking to? He's talking to us. Absolutely. Do that again. He that saith he abideth in him or continues in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. You say, Lynn. I say, yes. Yes. We are to walk in the light as he is in the light, because he is light. 1 John 1, 7, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship, koinia, with him, with, with one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It's interesting we want freedom from sin, freedom from guilt, freedom from condemnation, a home in heaven, yet do we want to walk as he walked? We've got to be comfortable. In the New Jerusalem, the coming new world of Revelations 21, those who know Christ will walk in the light of the glory of God and the light of the Lamb. They will be the light of it. We must abide, continue to live a life that honors God, not veering from the path, not walking, but walking with him every step of the way. We need to be aware to learn that God's word and to obey his direction and be fruitful. It is God's design that believers should live in union with his son and become fruitful. That is express the effects of their union with Jesus in their daily lives. It glorifies the Father. It's a changed heart and a changed life for you and I. Abiding continues in the love of the Father and the Son. John 15, 9 through 10. As the Father has loved me, Jesus said, so have I loved you. Are we conscious of that fact? As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. There's only one person, well, the Godhead, that is defined by, defined by a simple term. God is love. God is love. So the vine is love. You're a branch. You attach to the vine. 
you love. God is love. Lynn, have you ever expressed something other than love? Yes. Who's kidding who? Most of us, if we're going to be honest, has expressed something other than love. What happened to you? What happened to me? You hear this word go start to go around, and a little voice joins in there and says, that's not me, is it? Or some other rendition of that. And then we stand back and make a choice. What are we going to do in this same situation? I find that God's love has extended to Jesus. Je that love was manifested through the Son, through his death, burial, and resurrection. He invited me to become attached to him. He invited you to become attached to him. Therefore, when that connection is made, the same life is in them is in you and me. The capability of love is placed there. I can do that. I can do that. I can do that because he did that. I can follow his example, not in my strength, in his. I don't want to bore you from this standpoint. I'm going to tell you this story again. I was did wrong. Bad wrong. It could escalate, shape my future, put me, confine my growth process within the company I worked with, etc. Has any of you ever whined to God? You whined. You say, I'm a man, I don't whine. I could tell you my opinion of that. Perhaps you made it. I didn't make it. <laughs> okay. I didn't make it. Traveling across country from one village to home, I was whining to him, saying, you know what they're doing? You know what she has done? And he, rem he said, do you love her? <laughs> Cut right through all the garbage. Do you love her? He didn't yell it. He didn't shout it. He didn't do any of those things. He said, do you love her? What did you say? I said, no. Then he wasn't mad or upset with me. He calmly said, would you love her? Well, that set me right back in the seat. My want to might have been different <laughs> for a moment. He didn't get upset with me. Would I love her? He left the question with me. I said, sir, I can't. To get that done, you would have to do it. You'd have to assist me in it. That's long before I ever knew that it was already abiding in me. He thought he could get that done. She never became my long-lost buddy. When I moved from there, I didn't mind. But love expressed, and I had great opportunity the next day to live as he wanted me to live, because right behind that, when I said, with his help, I would do it, he said, tomorrow, do not, do not say a word in your own defense. Again, but, <laughs> but, but it hardly got out. You know, we make decisions that affect our life for time. The source in there is, is his life. Let him express himself through you. God is love. 
That is his definition. It is the nature of God. Divine love motivated God. He gave us his son, forgiveness, salvation, fellowship, eternal life. We see it most clearly in the crucifixion and the resurrection. This love, agape, love comes from the divine. It proceeds from himself. It proceeds from his nature. When we are born again through the Spirit, we can express this love. According to Peter, this power is meted to us, downloaded to us, as our knowledge of God is experienced and increases, and we thereby become a partaker of, his, of God's divine nature. Hebrews 12.10 makes a very interesting statement. It says, we are partakers of God's holiness, or we are partners of God's holiness, given to us. I'm going to read a fairly lengthy portion of Scripture that I don't normally do at this point, but I'm going to read it to you and make maybe a couple comments. It'll probably come a couple verses at a time, but it's first. It's Second Peter 1. We're going to read 3 through 9. Here is 3 and 4. According as his divine power hath given us. See that? Hath given unto us. Past tense. You have it. All things that pertain unto life and godliness. Life as God has it. Godliness. It's the manner of life in everyday conduct. It is profitable. It is a promise for today and life to come. Life and godliness, our manner of life. Okay, let me do this again. His divine power, does he have enough power to get this done? Hath, past tense, it's already been given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. We know things, we know things, and sometimes we choose just to ignore things. Don't ignore this. Whereby are given unto us, well, here we go again, whereby are given unto us, given, already yours, exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers or partners of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That is a definition, part of a definition of who and what you are. Wow. Wow. Can, Steph, can you give me Ephesians 4.24? This is just reinforcement to what we've talked about at various points this morning, that you put on the new man, or the new man is created of God. Is that what it says? The new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That's how, that's how you were created in the new birth. That's really how God sees you. You may not see yourself this way, but we need to recognize the fact that's how God sees us. Mm. I stopped reading, didn't I? Can we go back to Second Peter? One. Okay. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers or partners of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Verse 5, please. 
And besides this, as good as that is, besides this, giving all diligence, you give all diligence, add, you add to your faith virtue. What did the lady that had an issue of blood, what did she draw from Jesus? Virtue. I felt virtue. Interesting. Add to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience. Patience. To patience steadfastness. And to patience or steadfastness godliness. And to godliness brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness charity or agape love. Love as God has it. He that, in verse 9, 8 and 9, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off, has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wow. Pierce was faced with choices, ever ongoing choices. If these things be in you, which we've just described, they will manifest through you due to the fact that you, the branch, have received the vine's life. Then fruit, more fruit, much fruit, this fruit shall be his fruit created by, with, and of his likeness, his image. I got in my notes DNA, and I've been restless about that, so I'm just going to put it this way. This fruit will be his fruit created by, with, and of his likeness and his image. In our spirits, which is one with his spirit. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for oneness, oneness with you. That's first, oneness with you. Second is oneness with each other. And also with the recognition that our oneness with you ensures us that we have a place to lay at rest. If we are burdened and heavy laden, there's a place of rest. Father, you pull with each one of us because that's what Jesus came for and imparted to us and went away ever to live to make intercession for us. Thank you for your intercession for each one represented here, each one that is not here. They also have been blessed with blessings that are beyond our ability to, to comprehend, yet we do so enjoy taking advantage of them, so to speak, and enjoying them. Father, there is a scripture that you have given, that we have, and there is a peace that passeth understanding. A peace that passeth understanding. A peace that passeth understanding. A peace. Father, throughout this congregation, minister peace that passeth understanding. Mm-hmm. Peace that passes understanding comes to me. Can't be found anyplace else. Wrapped up in your love and the recognition of that love. Peace that passes understanding. Peace. Thank you for it. All praise, honor, and glory is yours. We receive from you this morning in this place. We can mark it down. I receive peace that passes understanding. I surrender to peace that passes understanding. I don't have to understand it. I just need to receive it and enjoy it. It's mine. Oh, yes, it's contrary to what the world thinks. Enjoy it. Peace that passes understanding. Peace. Peace. 
peace. Supernatural. From a divine flow and a divine spring from above. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Glory.